Good evening, everybody, and welcome to In the Hot Seat. Today, we are delighted to welcome a true polymath. John Rankin Waddle produced, has produced more than 30 books, launched four magazines, directed commer commercials and feature films, and is one of the world's most famous photographers, having shot everyone from Madonna to the late Queen. However, like Amani, Bailey, Beyonce, our guest is known by simply one name, Rankin. And Rankin is our in the hot seat guest today as chair of the marketing and advertising group, Rankin Creative. Rankin was born in Glasgow, moved to Yorkshire and studied accountancy of all things at Brighton Polytechnic. Not a typical background for someone that has gone on to transform the creative industry, initially as a photographer and now someone who is transforming the agency world. So there is, will be an opportunity for you to pose your questions to Rankin by putting them in the question section on the site, so please feel free to get involved. So good evening and welcome Rankin. Uh, and my first question really <laughs> is somebody as multifaceted like yourself, um, what's on your passport? What do you, how do you describe yourself? I hope you describe yourself as a cultural provocateur, but I shouldn't think the uh, immigration people <laughs> would respond that well to, uh, to that as a profession. It's funny because I, went and looked at my passport um, when you asked this question, because <clears throat> I'm quite literal about certain things and it doesn't actually have your um, career anymore or, or job oh. uh, in there, but it is a question that they definitely did used to have in there or they used to ask. And I used to say publisher. And the reason that I would say publisher is because they have a lot more sort of weight than photographer. Photographers kind of seen, especially by the uh, the you know the countries you're going to, as a kind of like oh well everybody every, you know especially these days everyone's a photographer. So publisher felt like if I was really unhappy, I would say you know I'm a I'm a publisher, you know I can do something about it. And um, it's the sort of thing that I would use at Hertz Rental or you know you know I'm a journalist. And I can write about this. I could quite enjoy writing. So I use it as a way of kind of of having a little bit of sort of power in those very strange situations where you have to complain. And uh, now <clears throat> I don't know what I'd write. I I see my I feel I think of myself as a photographer. At the heart of what I do is photography, and I still love photography. And I think after all of this is sort of done and done and and gone, I'll be a photographer. Um, I even think about sort of creating a studio at the bottom of my garden so I can take photographs. So, and during lockdown, I definitely reverted back to photography as my way of, of kind of dealing with things creatively. So yeah, I think of myself as a photographer. Okay, good. But somebody who studied accountancy, um, what was it? Yeah, that, for, uh, for a year. I did it for a year, like it was, <laughs> but I don't, I think I did it for two terms, two semesters, or whatever. So it wasn't, it wasn't, uh, I didn't take it very seriously. Was there creativity in the DNA of your family that suddenly made you switch or were you, did you rebel? I rebelled. Um, I don't think there was any thing in my history or my family that had any creativity in it at all. In fact, I think it was, we used to call people in my family that made things like commercials or films or photographers. They we used to call them they, and my dad would go, oh, "They did a great job on that, you know, McVitie's ad." Or I love that, I love that, um, you know, pick up a penguin ad. Or I love that R White. They did a great job on that R White's ad. Or you know, I loved that film. They did such a good job of making that film, The Sting. So it was they, and I think that <clears throat> I always thought of it as they until I was uh, at Brighton Polytechnic doing accountancy and I was surrounded by art students and the art students were all having a much better time than me. And um, I just gave up accountancy almost after the first term, but definitely after the second term, I picked up a camera and I suddenly realised that everything that I'd wanted to express in my 
kind of my my mind I could suddenly do it through a camera and, and through photography and because I was literate in terms of you know physics and chemistry and stuff like that um I could have I could understand photography I could understand the technical aspects of it and then I jumped into that and and I never I literally remember you know I learned two things the first time I picked up a camera of number one was I loved it and I, I felt like I could express myself and the second thing was that everybody told me I shouldn't do it and of course being the person I am I was like right I think the reason you're all telling me that is because I should do it so um, my dad didn't talk to me for a year which was quite fun a year and a half actually and um, I was very much a rebel yeah that that picked up creativity very 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 late on I think I was 20 when it happened um, just just about to turn 21 and um, I never really looked back. And, and, and I think actually that kind of not having any background in creativity or having, you know, other people's opinions sort of placed on my shoulders meant that when I came to creativity, I was really a blank canvas. And I kind of it allowed me to sort of paint those pages myself or paint that canvas myself. And I, I, I learned to be able to trust my own opinion through that period and not necessarily be influenced by too many people, which I didn't realize till later on, but it was definitely something that um, was, was part of my DNA. And also, and I, I kind of think that this is really important with creativity. In fact, I've been doing loads of interviews with marketing directors over the last uh, nine months. And one of the things that, is, that almost is the, the, the thing, the similarity between them is a lot of them have got one foot in reality and one foot in fantasy. And that foot in reality is super important to be able to make really great work because if you don't have it, if you're just away with the fantasy fairies of, of creativity, a lot of times, a lot of the times your work doesn't actually um, have an impact with the audience. So I think um, it's it's beneficial to come from that background for me anyway. For me, it's beneficial. Yeah, but the uh, just picking up on on that point, reality and uh, and fantasy. Is there a thing of commerciality? Is uh, are those marketing directors dampening creativity because they're no. being driven by the bottom line? No, I don't think so. I think the really good ones um, are really good at uh, actually. They talk a lot about being able to help the creative um, process and choosing the right creative teams. And, but, but at, at the same time, I've also worked, now I work directly with clients. I've worked with the people at the opposite. And um, one of the problems um, that I think a lot of the people may be listening or watching this um, now and later is that they're, they're finding that they've, they've learned this skill. They've probably gone to college to learn. They've probably done three to five years of education they've become masters at their craft and then some kid comes along and has a, has a, a phone and has all the apps on that phone and suddenly you think that they are either a creative director or a writer or a director or whatever you know a photographer is obviously very easy to be a photographer these days and the way that I like to express that to them is you know, you know, I went to college to learn how to do this so that I can fly the creative plane. Like I'm, I'm trained to fly that plane and I keep learning every day. And like the, the, um, the airline industry, every new thing that comes along, I learn and I learn and I learn because that's my job. And basically you've been in a simulator or in a game playing it. And it's like, it's very different because you don't have, you know, all of the things that could go wrong happening to you in real time, in real life. And I do. So anyone that's on watching this has been on a shoot when it's gone wrong. And if you're on a shoot with a junior creative who's only flown a simulator, they, you know, they run for the hills and screaming or, or, or alternatively turn around to you and scream at you. And um, they love to tell you what the, what you do wrong as well, but but the reality is they don't know how to fix it. Whereas if you've done it for a long time, you know how to fix it. And in fact, you can see the problems coming down the down the flight path or down the track as you're taking off or landing. So you know, to me, um, there are great people out there 
and there are really terrible people. And the worst thing is when they're giving the kind of creative keys of the Lamborghini to the kids that don't know how to drive them because they think that, you know, they, they, they think it's easy and it's not easy. It's a proper, proper, it's a proper career. In fact, it's one of the most amazing careers that Britain has to offer now. One of the only careers that Britain has to offer. The soft power of it is massive and it gives us so much power in the world creatively. And it's one of the only things that we can still be proud of is our creativity across the board and our sport, I suppose, as well. But creativity is something we hardly talk about. Uh, being great at, being the best at. And I think it's something that Britain is one of the best in the world at. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, back to the marketing directors. Um, one of the things I have learned is try and, try and um, you know, uh, do, do some form of, of session with a, a market director where you actually are asking them almost dating questions because you're going into a relationship with them. You're going into a proper, proper relationship where you need to rely on each other. And um, I've had lots of bad relationships in my life uh, personally, and, and now I'm in a good one. I know what a good one is. So uh, you learn, you've got to learn from all of those life things. So reality is really important, I think, and having, and all good creatives have that as well. They have the ability to cut through. It's not just marketing directors. But do you think the democratization of creativity that I suppose all these influencers have, all these creators who are, some brands are falling over. Do you think yep. at the end of the day, they will be found out and no. the people who've got a real creative training will come through? Oh yeah, no, I think that good, good, good things always rise to the surface. So, you know, you can look at creators out there who are producing amazing pieces of work and learning incredible skills. And you can look at really bad ones. And of course, you know, it's like photography. It's like there's thousands, millions of bad photographers, but giving the camera phone to a kid that can can rise to the surface and show how great like, that, that's always going to happen if you democratize anything so i think we as an industry need to be not uh nervous or worried about that but actually embrace it and try and make it part of you know our, our kind of educational learning or you know and also people come to things late like i was very lucky to have those art students telling me what are you doing you know if or i'd have been an accountant and then probably five years, six years later would have given it up and might have been a bit richer, but I definitely wouldn't have been richer culturally or socially. Um, so I think you have to, you have to accept that good work always works um, better than bad work. But of course, when there's lots and lots of people creating bad work, it can, it can, you know, sometimes get, they get lucky or sometimes people just like bad work um but you know all you got to do is look at i don't know some of the narrative stuff that um streamers are making there's amazing pieces on there and there's terrible pieces on there so it's not um there's no one way uh, no one thing no no one route or one um approach to it it's just very different and i think we just need to be we need to kind of knuckle down and and sort of put all our money on what we're good at and let, keep learning, keep learning. I keep learning. Well, I say to my wife, I'm, I'm experimenting with the, uh, you know, with the, with, with my medium when I'm, when I'm using all these apps and she's like, you're just taking selfies. I'm like, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm exper I'm trying to work out how kids are thinking. And she's like, you're just taking selfies. So it's also quite fun. All the new technology stuff. That I'm not somebody that's a hater of it. I quite, I quite like it. I just think it's also very dangerous at the same time. Okay. I lost track um, of counting the in, on your Wikipedia how many portraits you've done. I gave up after a hundred, um, but they cover the greatest names over the last uh, fifty Thank years. You. Everyone from Bowie, Gorbachev, the Queen, Madonna, you name it. Um, but what was the event that transformed the career from the guy from studying the Polytechnic and creativity and photography into the career that you've become um i think that probably the one difference of approach that i had was that i walked into the london college of printing and i was 22 i was uh you know i thought everybody was they that made these things 
um, photography felt like a very solo, autonomous, individual experience. And somebody handed me a magazine and I said, who made this? And they said, we did. And I said, and then suddenly the they became we, and that became me. And I think that gave me this extraordinary differentiation because I learned at the student union how to make a magazine. And in making that magazine, I learned how to make another magazine and then another magazine at the student union's expense. I learned a craft that was working in parallel to me being a photographer. And it really just was, you know, from a very naive perspective thinking, well, if, you know, back then, if I want people to see my photographs, I've got to get them in a magazine. So instead of going to magazines, why don't I control the medium that my work has been seen within? And that gave me this, I don't know, different way of being seen and being, I don't know, I suppose showing off or getting my work out there. And I think that then uh, gave me access, once we, be we became a bit successful, that gave me access to celebrity so the first person that called us to have their photo taken was Bjork and she wanted me to do a photo session not for the magazine but for her uh, based on the work she'd seen of mine in the magazine now she was probably wanting to be in the magazine but and she eventually was but but that got me a job and that celebrity or that first famous portrait I did then got me loads of work because everybody would follow Bjork, whatever Bjork did creatively, they would follow it. And then I got another job and then I got another job. And there's a really great photographer called Chris Floyd who does a talk. I'm sure he doesn't know that I've watched his talks, but he, he talks about the kind of the pathway of, of work. And he says, you know, he, he'll start with a, a job he does for free or like a charity or something over here. And then another person sees that and another person worked on that. And, you know, you go from Bjork to Madonna, you know, by the end of the decade for me. So I think that that differentiation is, is what made me stand out. And it was never one thing, uh, but Bjork definitely helped. And of all those portraits that you've, you've done, and we'll talk about, which is the most memorable shoot and which ones have been complete pains in the arse? Oh, I, I, I always think I always think that photographers, especially photographers, have got massive mouths about this stuff, and they like they 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 forget there's a kind of circle of trust about photography. I think you're a bit like a priest, um, without the kind of bad stuff that religion brings. Um, you know, you're you, and I'm agnostic. I get yeah. It's like I think it. I think um, you know, you 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 need to kind of really realize that that moment that you're spending with someone is really heightened and really weird. Um, but, you know, Bjork was amazing. Robert Downey Jr. was amazing. He was f like funnier than Ricky Gervais. If, if you like Ricky Gervais, his humor, I love it because it's, it's self-deprecating. He's like that and more. And then there are people who just didn't make an effort. They just didn't want to, they weren't, they didn't care about the process to kind of, the collaboration, the best people collaborate, the worst people think you're a, you know, you're, you're a smudger, as my mate Max says, smudge, good smudge, kid. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I photographed a band recently who are doing really, really well. And they were like, they hated all my pictures. And in the end, I was like, the reason they hate my pictures because they're taking their own pictures and retouching them on, you know, whatever app they're on. And they've got this very idealized version of themselves that it's almost impossible to recreate because I can't do what, you know, whatever app they're using, Facetune or whatever. I can't do that. I can't plump their lips and whiten their eyes without actually using that app. So, and, I, and I'd say that was a really rubbish experience, but it's because they didn't want to collaborate, you know, so they wanted to, you know, they wanted to look very much as they saw themselves social media ready. And I think that, that that's not what my job is. My job isn't to take a, a, a flattering picture that's enhanced. Um, of course, I want people to look good and look iconic, but it's, it's to reveal something as a portrait photographer. That's my, 
my job is to get something collaboratively out of them that people go wow you know we call them page stoppers you know that whenever you see it whether it's in a magazine or it's on the street on a billboard or whatever it's on that you stop and go oh what's that why is that person look why do they look what that shows me something about them and I've always had this theory that a good photograph should make you feel something immediately and then leave you thinking something afterwards. Um, and if you can do that, then, you know, you're, you, you're doing a good job. And if you're not doing that, then, um, you know, you should really consider your career. And also the other thing, and this, this is a big thing in my business, and it's really, it's a bit weird for me actually having an agency now because a lot of age, other agencies, especially big, the big agencies, the big owned, the widely owned, um, you know, the, the multinational companies, they won't use me because I've got my own agency. And I'm a bit like, I think I'm a better photographer now than I've ever been, you know, back in the day. But, you know, I'm seeing this competition and I find that so strange, especially with independence. I'm like, we, out of very, all of us, we should be allies with each other. We should be helping each other. We shouldn't be, you know, we should be sticking it to the man, not, you know, sticking it to each other. So, um, you know, what, with a photographer, uh, professional photographer, we make great pictures. We don't just take them, we make them. That's why I started an ad agency because you make, you make this work. You don't just take it. And um, if, you're, if, you're, if, you, if you're worth anything, you're only as good as your last picture. So you have to keep making good pictures again and again and again. And um, people would always say to me, why, why, you know, why are you so expensive? And I said, because I don't fuck it up. You know, I, I deliver what it says on the tin and, and I do it again and again and again and again. And of course, yeah, there's a few pieces of work out there that I'm not incredibly proud of. But a lot of the time I'd say that's because the, 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 the brief was rubbish or the client changed their mind. That junior client with the keys to the Ferrari when I'm going to burst the engine, you know, so um and i you know and i'm i'll fight as hard as i can to get great work out there but sometimes people just put so many so many um things in your way so it is hard but but that's that's the bottom line for me it's like i'm i'm a professional photographer so um i'm only as good as the last thing i did yeah <clears throat> but you know you talk about relationships and building those things up i mean of course famously the picture that you took of the late queen you had five minutes with her and you ended up with something that is, you know, iconic. So it's, um, it's not about, it's not about time, is it? No, no, no. Time is, um, once you've been doing it, as long as I've been doing it, time's got nothing to do with it. You know, like time's actually makes you more creative in a way because it's in your, it's in your DNA. I, I've probably photographed, you know, almost 500 thousand to a million people like i'm up there with you know i've i've done my ten thousand malcolm gladwell hours i've done them i've i've you know it's in my it's in my dna if i can't get a picture in five minutes i'm not worth paying you know so um the queen was great because she's a, she was a consummate professional she knew what i was after very very quickly and um you know, gave it to me and and was a, a total pro about having a photograph taken. So, and you you know, when you're in a room with somebody like that, you can get very intimidated by not just the person, but the situation and the surroundings. And your job is not to get intimidated. Your job is to work within that five minutes. And the funniest thing about that shoot is there was there was a, um, one of the the people that were were, were with her. Um, they asked me, do you want me to give you, you know, the, the, the timing at five minutes? I said, yeah, but make sure you tell me at four minutes, I've only got a minute left. And then at four minutes, I said, I've got it because I want, you know, you want to win. <laughs> you know, you, you gave me five, I took four, you know. So um, it's, 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 that's part of the, 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 the process of, of taking pictures and making pictures. Cause I made that picture. It was, I went into that shoot with a real idea about what I wanted and then knew that she was probably going to 
not want to give that to me but want to give me something and then you know and also I got lucky but I did my you know research and I thought about it and and in the end we together made a, a great picture brilliant thing about that picture is that no one uh, would have seen it unless she liked it because it wasn't right for the jubilee at the time but it was then seen later in an unseen pictures which I thought was just so you know, it almost was better. It was almost like being, everyone's like, oh, do you want an OBE? And I'm like, no, I've been in Desert Island Discs, so I've made it. Like, I don't need an OBE. Like, once you've been on, loads of people who get OBEs or knighthoods, I, I've been on Desert Island Discs. However yeah. hard it was, that's that's the biggest privilege in the world to be on something like that. So there's the, the, it's all the way you look at it. You know, it's like it, success to me isn't about, photographing the queen it's taking that photograph of the queen you know okay so having built this amazing career what made you some people say inspired some people say crazy decide to go into agency world and create an agency i mean look, I, I just want to start this this answer off by saying how much respect i have now for people that that create agencies, start agencies, and work in agencies, because I think that I underestimated how difficult it would be and how complicated it is and how, you know, complex clients are and brands are. And, and I've, it's been a very steep learning curve, which I love, I love putting myself in a situation that I have to learn. I keep trying to learn things again and again and again and also I've had I've morphed a few times in my career so I started as a photographer and I morphed into a publisher very early on and then I morphed into a director which I should never have been really um, and I spent sort of a good six years being rubbish at it um, before I kind of got the hang of it and then, and then I you know morphed into a film director again which I wasn't very good at the first time around and then I morphed into a production company and, um, you know, I've morphed a few times. So um, I thought that morphing, morphing, it sounds, it sounds like a very strange expression, but then sh shifting across to agency work would be natural and progressive. Um, and there was a massive gap because social media and the digital revolution meant that suddenly it was the wild west out there. And, and I thought, well, you know, I can step into it. I'm a good storyteller. I'm naturally, you know, insightful and strategic through editorial. I like storytelling beyond just taking pictures or making pictures. And I love analysis. So, and I'm, I, you know, I've been managing people for, for years. So in publishing, so it felt really kind of natural, but the reality is, is that um, it's probably the most difficult thing I've done and and I have to say my respect for everybody within the industry has gone, you know, gone through the roof. Um, and I'm somebody that doesn't quit. So if I decide to do something, I continue and continue to like, I can see myself having some success within it. And it wasn't, you know, I've been doing it since 2016. So the eight crack ranking creative has been around for three and a bit years, but three and a half years almost. Um, but you know, I was I was working directly to client from about 2016. So I learned I've learned a lot in that time, and I've literally jumped in the deep end. And now I feel like I'm getting somewhere with it. And um, and I did it because of you know it was the Wild West, but also the power the empowering the process has always been really important to me. So this is a kid that went to you know college and someone gave them a magazine and then taught themselves how to do magazines and I literally taught myself I didn't have any help back then really so sort of the agency part of it felt like it was a natural sh shift and progression but um, I've actually had to get sort of educate educated with it I've actually had to hire people and work with people and collaborate with people that do understand it and I have to say it's also very very uh, competitive and quite dog eat dog it's quite um it's you know photography is a little bit more honest if I'm honest um you know you can see your enemies 
in front of you. Um, whereas betting stabbed in the back doesn't seem to be um, unusual um, in this in this world. And um, you know the pitch process I find very unusual. I think it's a very damaged process, and I think that it definitely needs to be looked at. And actually, talking to a lot of the marketing directors that I talk to in this series I did called Through the Lens. A lot of them don't enjoy the pitch process. They think it's actually, um, you know, it's diminishing to the creative process as opposed to ad 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 adding to it. And it's really kind of like the, the, the big multinationals, they, they enjoy it. They seem to enjoy it a lot more than the, the indies do because it's a, it's a numbers game for them. You know, if they're on enough pitches and they're chucking enough money at it, they'll win you know so and, they, and they'll undercut and they'll the cut and frost is pretty horrific so i i, I guess I, I guess i was a bit naive but um yeah i think i'm trying yeah. to be honest within it yeah that was a very honest well, answer wasn't it yeah it was very no well well i mean the alliance this year is doing a big uh thing around pitching um which we're kind of phrasing ditch the pitch um ditch the pitch is and, great and um so i we will follow up in terms of some of those insights all, to your game from Mark. It's, it's all about it's all about it's all about chemistry, and it's all about dating. Like I think, actually, you know, actually spending time with the person you, the people you're going to work with, the person you work with, and in being inquisitive and and interrogating that, and what's your ambition and what you want to achieve, and all of those things. Because if you don't have the same uh, values and approaches there's no point in working together literally there's no point because it is destructive and it's and I, I could easily throw clients under the bus and say well that client did this and that client did that and it's dead easy to do that but actually they're just approach is very very different and sometimes very progressive maybe too progressive and sometimes actually more sort of backward and I've, I've experienced both both of those and I find all of it very unusual very unique and the, the weirdest thing is when people at the top don't talk to the people you know the, the ladder up and down I find that absolutely bizarre like why you know people that are very important to decision making get brought in at the last minute um, which is like a bit like me you know, pulling the curtain back, the Dorothy moment where I'm like, what, this is how it works? You're all nuts. <laughs> like, you know, why don't we get around this table and talk about this stuff because it would be much more productive. But, but um, of course, you know, I, I have to not ditch the pitch uh, yet because I need to win the work. Yeah, well, it, there's always going to be a level of pitching, but it's got to be done as you say, about building relationships and not necessarily having the creative shootouts for work that never sees the light today. But that's for a, that's for a, another another time. Another discussion. But it is another discussion. But the uh, do you see, though, in this landscape that we've got, a clear distinction between the group agencies, you've kind of touched on it, and the independents? And is this the era that the independents can actually kind of come through or doesn't it make a difference yeah i think it i think it does i mean when you hire an independent you're always hiring the people that own it so and a lot of the time they're going to be the people that have got not just the passion and commitment but they've actually got you know the the guardianship of their work because it's them and it's their name over the door or it's their it's their love, the love of their life. Like cre creativity is the love of my life. Photography is number one, but creativity is what I love doing. So you're always going to get that thousand percent. Like, you know, you don't, you don't um, dial it in. You know, I never dial it in. And um, I'm sure everyone on this call who works for their own agency or has their own agency, you don't dial it in. You, you, you know, it's a different, it's a different ethos. I've been on, I've been on jobs where the creative director is just watching movies in the corner or not looking at the screen, you know, and they're going, can you try this? And I'm like, I tried that like 20 minutes ago. Like you're just not fucking watching mate. And, um, you know, I've also been on jobs where the, 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 the creative director of the ECD is like over your shoulder and each of them are difficult, but I'd rather have over the shoulder 
any day of the week. I'd rather have the passion any day of the week and the commitment um, to to be a guardian of not just the idea, but the, the kind of bigger brand. So um, I think, yes, that's that's that makes a lot of sense. And the more the multinationals, um, you know, they put pressure on the kind of more senior people to either leave. I mean, I think a lot of the news, one of, one of the other reasons I started an agency was because I watched a lot of my friends who were ECDs being chucked out of jobs because, the, you know, the, the big corporate uh, accountants were thinking, this is the opportunity to get rid of those big salaries. This is the opportunity because kids are understanding these things better than, you know, the people that have been doing it for a long time. And and, uh, and I was like, that's crazy. Like, have you ever been in a room with Walter Campbell, you know, creating something with Walter Campbell? Like, forget about it. Like, no one's going to make more interesting comments than, than someone like Walter Campbell. He's going to make you, you know, do something or think something or twist something in a way in which you just, you just, your work is better by a long, long way. So... And um, I think that that's been lost in a lot of the the bigger multinationals. Not all of them. There are some great. Jules Shortly at Ogilvy is a really amazing ECD, and there are guys out there. People, not guys, people out there, because uh, they're not just guys. There's loads of the fantastic creatives out there that are exceptional at what they do. But then the account team, you know, scare the living hell out of me because they don't really they're they're bean counting so so i think when you're an indie you know you know that all of those people are sitting around the table like my team my strategies you know she's she's so passionate so you know we're we care about it and so does the the head of accounts like she cares and we talk about things in terms of caring to the point that we care more than the client sometimes and then you're kind of going why are they why are they putting hurdles in your way when you're trying to do something better and I think that if you're hearing this and you've got a similar situation you, you we know that that's what we bring to the table now beyond that we can't chuck money at it we can't do it for free we can't have the piss taken out of us we, we prefer honest conversations you know we all want it to be a very different way of working so the right marketing director or the right brand manager is going to work with that to our advantage and the wrong one is going to work with them against our advantage and then the worst thing is you know when you get used as a pawn or you got thrown under the bus i love i've been thrown under the bus a couple of times i'm like what just ha- hold on a bit where did that bus come from you know and i don't know i've i work with a guy called um you know, I, I work with an amazing team, but I work with people that, that you know, bring, you know, I, I've a, I, I have like a leadership training person that really helps me, you know, get, understand all this stuff because I wouldn't have understood it before. Yeah, is that why you brought Richard Pinder in? I mean, he's a, he's a agency heavyweight from groups. Has he brought a yeah. balance to the creativity? Yeah, absolutely. R- R- Richard is Richard's. Yeah, but he. The great thing about Richard is that he's an indie mind with a group experience. So, like, he's the thing. The similarity between myself and Richard is that we're not scared of new. So, if someone throws something at us, we just try and work out how to make it work. So we're problem solvers. Um, and of course, I totally lean on him. Um, you know, I mean, the easy thing would be to say that he can be a suit in a suit world. Um, but I don't actually think that's the benefit of him. You know, the benefit of him is he's a wolf in sheep's clothing. You know, he's, he's, he's that person who looks and sounds and, and maybe even acts a bit like a suit, but he's not. He's, a, he's, he's incredibly adept at being able to see what's a good idea and, 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 and kind of, you know, he gives amazing feedback to creativity that I have learned how to give feedback to creatives from him because he's just got this 
he's got this nose for a good idea and I think that that's got a lot to do with him having worked in this industry but also you, some people just have a nose for it they go that's gonna be great so trust is such a big part of being in a small agency because you need to really trust that each of you have that ability to smell a good one a good idea and then being able to you know being able to make it work and help each other and support each other and make it work but but um, also being able to say, no, that's not going to work. And Richard does that really well. I'm, I'm much worse at going, no, that's shit. He would never say it's shit. <laughs> Ever in a million years, he'd say, well, I'm not sure that one's quite the right one or it's going to work. And he's just very good at that. And I kind of needed that because creatives are a very, well, everybody's, you know, very, got a very different approach within the creative industry within the agency industry or the agency uh, genre you know it's very different because it's the, the the amount of time that we spend talking about stuff um in in advertising is kind of compared to what you do in magazines or you do i don't know even filmmaking it's so crazy it's like it's the balance is so it's so different like we, we talk and talk and talk so the pressure and the kind of even just the pressure of making something is so compounded by all of the other factors that the people that work within it have to have a very certain type of personality to be able to make it work and again what I've learned is you know I, if I was on a movie I'd have to trust my AD I'd have to trust my DOP that's that's like literally you know swimming with with unicorns it's like amazing in the industry in the in ad industry it's like swimming with sharks it's like you've got to totally have each other's back and really believe in each other and be honest with each other it's very very important to be honest yeah what do you i mean stephen bush uh is on the call um technology um expert he's kind of asking what's the role of ai because if you if you believe what people read, creativity will be overtaken because you know the computers will be creating for us. How do you see all that? I think it's like like anything else. It's just another tool. So to me, um, you have to curate that shit. You know, like a lot of what my job is is curating um, and being able to smell something that's good. Like I'm not even a very good. I would never try and be an ECD or a CD. Like I'm terrible at it. Fucking terrible at encouraging people and getting the best out of them. I'm rubbish at it. But um, I know a good ECD and I know when it works and I definitely know a good idea. And that's kind of the secret source of Rankin Creative is I do know when something's good. So if they come with an idea, I go, that one's going to be a winner. Like I can promise you because I've got one foot with the audience so massively that I can really, I can really get it. And I think AI is just going to make everything faster again. You know, it's going to, those ideas are going to be thrown at you. And of course, you know, homogenous, anything that's homogenous is always, you know, it's like data. It's like anything that's telling you what someone wants doesn't tell you what they dream of. You know, I remember I, I interviewed Martin Sorrell about, creativity and obviously he's heavily in, involved and has, has heavily kind of financed data and believes in it so much and and he was like you know what would you change about it I'm like not not really anything I think it's I think it's all very exciting that we can have that access to you know what people really want but that's not what I sell I sell what people dream of and you know, whether that's for a car company or for a beauty brand, it's like I'm selling the thing that's emotional and has that kind of connection that and the unexpected. And um, and I know, and the reason I know that is because people, you know, will come to me and tell me I'm doing that. You know, I wouldn't I wouldn't have the arrogance anymore anymore to go that's me it's like people go oh this is what you do 
And I go, yeah, shit. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't really put it in those words, but now I know. Um, I'm like, yeah, that's what I do. I, I'm, I'm looking at what the fantasies are, what the kind of, you know, what's going to be, you know, the thing that no one talks about, the thing that people are scared of, the thing, and an AI is not going to tell you that, you know, sorry, um, um, you know, that's not the way that that works. It's like the human, the human brain and the human condition is a million times more com complex than any computer can ever, you know, um, tr try and emulate. And of course that will get better and better and better, but there's always going to be that weird thing that as a human being, you're brought up to, to sort of act a certain way. Like I would say I'm a contrarian because I'm originally Scottish and I was brought up in Glasgow and in Glasgow, the equity in Glasgow is, you know, it's more about what religion you are than what race you are, like, or what, you know, what, what your poverty level is. It's like, you know, everyone's treated like very evenly. So I've had that in my DNA for, you know, for, for, for 50 odd years. So <clears throat> I don't know if you, an AI can do that. And may, maybe it can, maybe I'm just being naive, but I just really believe that curation is going to be there within it. Um, and also, do you know what? I fucking hate all this, like jumping on bandwagon shit, like metaverse. What the fuck was that about? Every, all these companies, especially the big multi, you know, oh, we're going to have a metaverse department. Like, it's not, it doesn't even exist, guys. Like, all these metaverse experts going, let me tell you about the metaverse. And, oh, look, look, you know, at the end of the day, like, whatever you, you know, if you're an indie and you're selling that shit, good luck. Good luck. It keeps the money rolling in and, that's a great thing if you're trying to create and uh, trying to keep a, an independent going. But the reality is <clears throat> it was just a marketing campaign for Meta. You know, that's what it was. It was a marketing campaign for, for, for Facebook and it worked really well because everybody bought into it and we all bought the lie. Um, same as NFTs, same thing. Just a oh, yeah. load of bullshit um, for a pyramid scheme and it's based on Bitcoin. Like, I remember some bloke came to me and said, you should get into Bitcoin back at probably about, I don't know, 12, 10, 12 years ago. And I said, why? Because you'll be a millionaire. And I went, but how will I be a millionaire? What will I have made that will have made me a millionaire? Nothing. I'll have made money. And it's like, I don't, I don't want to look at myself in the mirror and go, you just made money out of making money. I don't know. You know, maybe I watched that, you know, Michael Douglas film, you know, uh, in the 80s and it had an effect on me but I just think greed is not good I'm sorry greed isn't a good greed 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 is what you should apply to your creativity not to your bank balance yeah okay let's stay away from Wall Street I mean Gellin yeah. Watt uh, one of the alliance's uh, great creatives I mean he's asked what would you like to see from agencies when there are more than ever I mean you know, we could have seen a lot of agencies being lost during the pandemic but in fact there's been greater proliferation but as a collective, what should agencies be doing more? I think we should be more allies to each other. Like that's my, that's my big takeaway from the last 10 years, but definitely since 2016 is our enemies are not us. You know, it's not, that, that definitely came from me being a photographer and thinking, why did that photographer get that? And why did that photographer get that? And why didn't I get that? And that kind of green envy kind of jealousy thing. It's just pointless. It's like, you know, Boris Johnson is the, one of our biggest enemies. You know, Rishi Sunak is one of our biggest enemies, not because of their political affiliation, but because of what they've created, you know, and it's like, I'm sorry, but, you know, the, 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 the you know, I, I just watched the Lord Heseltine, you know, on Instagram, you know, giving it to some right wing tv show and like he's right like this is this is seven years later guys you know like we're still we my wife can't distribute her tea in europe because it costs too much money what and you don't think that's affecting people in every single aspect of society it's like the and you know and on a bigger level all the other crazy things that are going on in the world and the echo chambers that we've created with social media and all of those things they're they're the enemy not the allies of each other you know we should be helping each other and supporting each other and and also the brands out there that want to make a difference we should you know they should be trying to work with us because we want to make a difference so 
I think that if you're in this just to make money, you should get out like as quickly as you can because it's definitely not about that. I mean, I, I think there should be a thing called the Alliance of Independent Agencies in order to um, really deliver what you talked about because that's really what we're all about, which is about creating alliances as opposed to kind of trying to eat eat each other up yeah and, and being competitive undercutting each other that's for the big boys let them do it and 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 also if you're a mug if you're if you're a client out there and you're mug enough to you know either nick someone's ideas on a base you know nick their ip because you can or you know under get them to be undercut against each other because you can you're the mug you're the mug at the end of the day because you, no one's all those big big boys they're not going to be able to deliver what the young sorry then we're not all young the the small indies are going to be able to give you because the passion and the commitment that we give you is going to be so much more um powerful and impactful um we because we care we actually give a shit about it um and we're not looking at our bottom line and um, I, you know I yeah. always like it when we lose to a big like multinational because I'm like, good luck. I'm like, good luck with keeping your job in, in a year because forget about it. Like somebody up the chain is going to get pissed off with you and you're going to have to move. So because you, there's just no way that, you know, we I think people look at me and they think oh, I'm, I'm trying to like rip them off or something like because because we try and charge like proper proper fees or proper money to do things but the reality of it is that i don't think i've ever made that much money making stuff that i really truly believe in so any of my clients that i've worked for i put you know if they pay me proper properly i don't make that much money and i put a thousand percent into it and i bet you every single indie agency that you represent and is listening or watching this do the same i bet you yeah. so and I would rather put my money on them than on, you know, the mugs game of getting, I don't know, like all the other stuff that comes with it, you know, coupling, uncoupling, what the fuck is, you know, you know, it's just a trek that it's all just like buzzwords to, 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 to sell you something that actually doesn't mean anything. So, um, you know, good creativity doesn't matter. That's why Walt Campbell's really good because it doesn't matter what platform or what, a device you're watching it on he's a good storyteller that knows and understands how to get to the, the emotional heart of a brand and be able to cut through the noise that all the other crap people are, um, are making and he can still do it and he's going to probably be able to do it for a long time so i believe in that <clears throat> i believe in that yeah i mean pierce palmer from kayad kind of asks about the space and time that you need to come up with great creative ideas. Do you need more planning um, to get that inspiration or is it something that you feel that clients don't respect and therefore want it kind of on the hoof? I mean, any client that doesn't respect planning is mental, in my opinion. Um, and I have to say that strategy is something that was probably the most difficult thing for me to understand when I came to the world because to me it was editorial. So... I'm like, my finger's already on the pulse. Why do I need someone to tell me what the pulse is? But then when I, when I, when I started to really work with good people, you know, my first planner was a girl called Laura, who is a woman called Laura is amazing. And um, I've got an, the best planner at the moment, a strategy person called Nimi, who's so extraordinary at what she does. And we have the discussion and debate. And when you can marry up editorial and planning, and you know strat and strategy and insight and get all that stuff aligned the ideas are in there you know like it's 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 like the the nuggets are either in the mouth of the client or in the insight they're there so pulling them out is always about that and anyone that's not doing that i think you know if you're going on gut instinct good for you good luck but gut instinct should be part of it. It shouldn't be all of it. So, and also anybody that's doing something trend-based like metaverse or I don't know, web three or anything that's just about what's fashionable, like, you know, whether it's AI or anything, just be careful because 
that that um idea of of surface it doesn't really work with the audience anymore they're being sold to and lied to in culture so much by social media by politics by the news by you know whatever it is that one of the best things about advertising in the last sort of 10 years is it's become more and more honest i think so i think that if you can buy into that and we can redefine the industry in a way which you think, oh, actually, the industry is about, you know, actually telling the truth. Then, um, and I know that some marketeers out there will be like, telling the truth, that's like, what, what's that about? Well, but actually, well, trust is still, yeah, trust is still. Yeah, kind of, but also if, a, you go back to, if you go back to David Ogilvy, like, is it David, it's David, I always get his name wrong. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff that they were talking about back in the 50s and 60s, it's not about selling, it's about, you know, being able to, you know, understand the audience and what they needed and then sell. So we we've we've just cut the, the lying bit out of it. And I think that, and I hate the people that hate purpose. I think it's like such an easy, you know, and, and people go, well, that's just a trend. And it's like, no, it's not. It's like, that's here to stay. That was just something the industry needed shaken up on. You know, it wasn't about it being the metaverse or diversity, or, uh, diversity for, you know, for performative sake or, um, you know, being a, being a, and what's the other one that I really had disruptor, you know, there's a lot of there's a lot of that kind of doing something for the, the because it's a buzzword and it's actually like you know those things when you're actually doing them for real and they're actually you know important like purpose or diversity or actually kind of being a contrary like a contrary to challenging your client you know then it means something but when it's done performatively which it does does happen then it means something completely separate so you know purpose when it's done badly yeah it's terrible it's rubbish when it's like oh we're supporting you know this <clears throat> charity there's no connection there's no you know real reason for it yeah it's terrible but actually being more honest with the consumer or the audiences that we like to, as we like to call them in rank it creative it's like you know that's what they want they don't want they they lie to by people like boris johnson um and nadine dora is constantly you know they're constantly lied to by the news and the media so why would they want you know something that's either escapism or a bit of reality so i just think i just think that personally there's so much room for people within the industry that are honorable and they're trying to do good work and and there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of sharks out there okay um we're coming up to the end of our time um you got I've six got questions one... though what you do yeah. <laughs> I've got I've... loads of questions i can see them i've got i've got yeah but i've got i think I've, i think i've been through most of them actually um the uh and and, and time and, and time oh, yeah is, uh, no we should go too long but we are the edit but i would like out of this, you know, diverse career that you've got, what's the ranking legacy? What have we, I mean, we haven't got into the whole thing about death, which you've done some amazing work around in order to make it a much more open topic. We haven't got time to discuss it now, but because you have addressed it, what is the legacy? What, what do you want that legacy yeah. to be? Well, I always think, I always wanted to be the, at, at the marketing person that, that sold death, you know, like I thought it was a really good, you know, I solved the problem with death, but um, I don't think it's interesting because I think the more, the older I get, the more I realize that <clears throat> photography, especially but anything you do creatively, it really is about um, how do you, how do the audience um, react to it? Like when you take a picture, once you let it put it out there, it becomes the audience's picture. It's not yours. And, um, you know, if you were talking to someone like Damien Hurst, you would say, the reason we make all this stuff is to live forever but we don't live forever <clears throat> we live forever maybe as a name that made this piece of work but a lot a lot of the time someone like me the work is going to go on and people have got will have no idea who i am but the fact that the work goes on and maybe some kid will look at it and go god i think that picture is great or that book is great or whatever then i like the idea that the kind of 
the, the, the ripples of my, you know, my life body, whatever, falling in the water will last for a long time. I like, I like that idea, but I don't believe that legacy should be kind of held onto, you know, in that kind of reverential way, because I think that actually that me makes you very kind of egotistical and quite kind of selfish. And actually, um, if I've learned anything is to get the balance right between, you know, being that kid who just wanted to be successful and those ripples to mean something and actually realizing that, you know, the life you lead is as important as the, the is what you leave behind. So that's kind of what I'm working on now. Okay. Well, I think you've opened up a lot of eyes to a lot of ideas in this last hour. So for that, um, I thank you a lot. I think also when we go, when we, when we relook at it again, you've done a fantastic ad for the Alliance in terms of saying, you know, we should be allies with one another. You should hire one me. Another. We, we could do some pro bono want, work for you. <laughs> we, we want ranking. <laughs> You put the words to my mouth. We, we have been discussing with Richard. You will be part of the Alliance without shadow of a doubt where there are lots of things we can do, but that's for, that's for another day. Um, all I can do to read tonight is to thank you very much indeed for your time. No, it's thank been, you. It's been fascinating. Um, and, uh, and I think we've just kind of touched the surface. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think we need great personalities like you in the indie industry. Well, thank um, in you. That to, really uh, means a lot to, to me. To... to, to uh, to, to, to speak on, on on our behalf so that's really important so thank you very much indeed thanks thank you everyone for, for joining and yeah. um i just want to do a bit of an ad for the next one the next um in the hot seat will be on may the 17th we have got um the presenter of the podcast crisis what crisis he's the ex-editor of the news of the world former head of downing street communications for david cameron and he was an inmate in Her Majesty's prisons. Andy Not Coulson, Andy Coulson. Oh. Andy Coulson will Andy will be joining us um, in uh, on May the seventeenth to give talk him, about. Give him a hard in. time, mate. Like you no, know, you need he's, to... he's he's fa he is fascinated. We talk. About, we live in a difficult industry, and what Andy has learned about resilience and through his own personal oh, that's experiences good. That's good. Is, yeah, is, resilience. is quite. Is quite something. He is uh, he, he's a remarkable individual. Many of many of us would have uh, fallen apart, but he's uh, held it all together and is bringing that advice to uh, to many now. So Andy will be joining us on May the seventeenth. But for tonight, thank you very much, D Rankin. Everybody else, have a really good evening, and um, we'll see you again soon. Thank you. Thanks all.